twist it around and you give it to your brother to stop. Okay, and of course they can't. <laughs> so there's, a, there's an odd even symmetry here which gets violated if you, if you do that. It's the same, same type of the symmetries um, that, that Galois was talking about. Okay, summing up. There are simple problems in classical mathematics where the usual methods of solving them do not work. Okay, again, addition, subtraction, squares, two groups, roots, and all that, they can't solve some of the questions. Okay, and again, it's talking about these limitations of knowledge. Okay, Girdle's there. Okay, so this is Kurt Girdle. This is one of the strangest looking pictures you've ever seen. Okay, and Girdle was a, um, he was a neighbor of Einstein. Okay, and Einstein, there, there's a legend about Einstein that if, if Einstein was in a building, and there was some experiment, he was such a theoretician and not an experimenter, that if Einstein was in some building and there was an experiment going out, the experiment would fail. <laughs> so, so he didn't use, he used to stay home all day. But what, what he would do is he would come to the office and they would ask him, why do you go to, why do you go to the institute? He lived on, you can see his house now, and, his house. and he'd, say, he'd say, I go to the institute so I can walk home. Now, Gertel was a lot younger than him, but he was extremely bright, and they used to have these long talks. Um, just one side story. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, right. <laughs> one side story. So, so um, Ger uh, Einstein proved um, that basically um, the way you look at the universe, time travel is impossible. Okay. There's no way you can go backwards in time. We're all going forwards in time, but there's no way of going backwards in time. And so he was explaining this to his little friend, Mr. Girdle. And Girdle, who was a logician, but a very bright logician, sat down and he worked out some equations and he showed that there's another model of the universe in which time travel would be possible. Okay? And you'd be able to go back in time and do some strange things. Um, now, somebody went over to Girdle and they said, you know, what about what about the time travel paradoxes? For example, you can go back and shoot your parents before they met, or you know, or make sure your parents don't meet. That's um, Back to the Future, right? Okay. So you make sure your parents don't meet, or, or even something simple is go Back to the Future and make sure that you don't get into the time travel machine. That would cause a paradox, or, or or things like that. Okay. It's called the grandfather paradox. If you shoot your bachelor grandfather, you know what what would happen. So that would cause a paradox because if you shoot your bachelor grandfather, then you wouldn't born to shoot your bachelor grandfather. Okay, and, and Gertl said, Gertl, who was a logician, he knew about contradiction, says there's no problem. There's no such thing as a contradiction in the universe. The universe will not allow you to go back. They'll allow you to go back in time, but they won't allow you to cause a contradiction. You won't be able to cause a contradiction. You might take your gun out, you might shoot your bachelor grandfather, but the, the bullet's not going to go because you're not going to allow a contradiction in the universe. So it's, it's interesting stuff. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about Gertl's theorem and what he became famous for. And this is the early 30s. So it's a little bit, Epimenides says all Cretans are liars, but Epimenides was a liar. So it's some type of paradox about himself. Okay? If all, the, if all Cretans are a liar, then he's a liar and he's saying the falsehood. Okay? Or the sentence. This sentence is false. If it's true, then it's false. And if it's false, then it's true. Okay? So you have this self-reference, this ability to talk about itself causes this, because the English language can talk about itself, you get this limitation. So, question, is this sentence true or false? Well, if it's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. It's neither. Now, there are a lot of questions, there are a lot of statements that are neither true nor false, like, um, um, your place or mine? That's a, a nice question. It's either true or false. But here we have a sentence about something, and it's neither true nor false. Okay, so what's going on? Sentences are talking about sentences. Here we have English sentences talking about sentences. Here we have Epimenides making a statement about Cretans. He is a Cretan. He is making a statement about himself, about its own sentence. And so you get some type of paradox. Okay, some type of limitation. This is causing a limitation. Either the sentence is meaningless, the sentence is true or false is meaningless, or neither true nor false. Okay, one nor the other. Okay. Gertl said about this, what about math statements? Talking about math statements. Okay, so fine. 
English is a screwy sentence, is a screwy language, or any language is a screwy language, because you can have sentences that talk about themselves and you get into, into problems. But what about math? Math, we can't allow a country, but there are no contradictions in math. What happens there? Okay, so this is exactly what Gödel did. What he did was he had math sentences talking about math sentences, and he got to have limitations, not contradictions, but limitations. Okay, so convert math statements into symbolic statements. This is why students hate us, right? Because we draw symbols rather than, you know, what do you feel about, you know, the derivative of x squared, or x times itself, x squared is too much of Okay, so convert math statements to, to symbolic statements. Then convert symbolic statements into math statements, and I'll show you. I'll show you how we do this. Okay, we can assign unique numbers to symbolic ones. So again, you start off with math, you go to symbols. That we all do. You go to symbols, you go back to math, and then you're going to have math talking about math. Okay? So we can have math statements talk about math statements. Let's do it. Okay. So here's a nice English sentence that students like. Every number has a successor. It's even true and easy. Okay, and then we do it like this, and the students are upset about it. For all a, for any number a, there exists a b such that b is equal to a plus one. That says every number has a, a successor. But now let's make this into a math statement. Okay, and what we can do is we can assign every symbol into a number, and then we can make this into a number. Okay, so this math statement, can, there could be a number. Like that. That's exactly what he does. Okay. Um, I'm skipping a little step, but let's do another example. Distinct natural numbers have distinct successors. For all a and b, a is not equal to b. That implies that a plus 1 is not equal to b plus 1. Very intuitive, very true, but scary looking with lots of symbols. But again, you can do the same thing. For all a, for all b, um, there exists an a, if a plus a is not equal, and you can go on. Okay, so again, you start off with math, Put it into symbols, but you can, what you can do is you can arithmetize. You can take the symbols and put them back into math, making them into math statements. And that's exactly what Gödel's theorem is about. Let's, let's just go through it. Okay. Then you can have a predicate. A predicate is something that's true or false. Proof x, y. Okay. This says that the logical formula is x proves y. So, again. One of the things about making math into symbols is that you can have everything very exact. Okay, you can have exact things. So we can have x is now a number because we've changed all our math statements into numbers. Okay? And y is a number. And so you can plug in two numbers here and you can ask yourself the following question. Does this number that represents a proof prove this statement? Okay. And again, this can all be done very, very, very legitimately, very, very exactly. Okay, now look at the following statement. For all x, that's so for all x, it is false that proof x, y. Okay, now what does that say? It says, for every single x, it is false, not true, that proof of x comes to life. What that means is, y is not true. It's exactly what it means. It means no matter what number you put in here, y, this will be false, that proof x, y. In other words, a proof, a y is not proved by the first proof, it's not proved by the second proof, it's not proved by the third proof, etc. Et now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about ourself. Okay? This sentence is false. This is a sentence talking about itself. Okay, so let's do that. Let's make the statement g equal to, for all x, it is false, that proof x, g. What does that mean? G is not, it cannot be proved. Just like this says Y is not provable, here's G is not provable. Now here I'm skipping a little bit of a step, but that's okay. Now, what this sentence says is as follows. It says G is not provable, or this sentence G says G is not provable, or what it says is, instead of this sentence is false, it says this logical sentence is unprovable. We're not talking about truth, we're talking about provable. Here. So we're saying this logical sentence is not provable. Question: Is it provable? Okay. Well, the very fact that I say for all x for any number it's not provable means it's not provable. Okay. So for all x it's not provable. So question: Is the sentence provable? No. Question: Is it true? Yes, because what does it say? It says it's not provable. So it's true. 
Okay, so you have a sentence that's true but not proven. Okay, let me show you why this is a type of limitation. Okay, before Gurdjieff came along, everyone believed that what's true is proven. Namely, you have this whatever whatever can be true, whatever is true. There's somebody clever in the world, and it's somebody clever enough to find the proof. Okay. Okay, and then Gertl comes along and says, no, 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 it doesn't go there. There's true statements, and then there's provable statements, and then there's this Gertl sentence, which is true, it's a true sentence, but it's not provable. Okay? So this is a shocking thing, that there are sentences out here that are true, but not provable. So Gertl was the first one. And it, I was telling him before, it's not only that there's one, the vast majority of statements Whatever, in whatever sense, in whatever way that means, the vast majority are out here. There are very few things that are provable. Countably infinite, but very few. Nevertheless. Okay. Okay. This goes on a little bit longer. This is the last thing, so we can go on a little bit longer. Maybe we can prove it. Maybe we can prove it. Maybe mathematics is inconsistent. Okay. Now, don't tell anybody out there because. The, you know, like the, we make them struggle with math, but maybe it's inconsistent. Maybe you can prove anything. Okay? Maybe P and not P is true. Okay? Maybe mathematics is inconsistent and can prove anything, including girdle sentences. Again, it's the, it, it is consistent that you can't, but we have to somehow state that. So we have to restate Girdle's theorem. Girdle's theorem doesn't say that there's things that are true and unprovable. We say it as follows. If mathematics is consistent, then the Girdle sentence is true but not unprovable. Okay, so we have to add in this if mathematics is consistent. Because otherwise, anything is, is possible. Okay, good. So now we'll assume the following. Okay, so one second. So read the second line first. We prove that if mathematics is consistent, then the Gödel sentence is true but unprovable. Now assume the following. Assume it is provable that mathematics is consistent. Okay, this was the first part of what we were talking about. Now let's assume this. It is provable that mathematics is consistent. Now, by bonus points, it's provable this. We prove this. Past 10 minutes, we prove this. So what do we get? Mathematics is consistent, and if mathematics is consistent, it is, then the Gödel sentence is true but unprovable. Okay, what we just did was, by modus ponens means P implies Q and P, we get, it is provable that the Gödel sentence is true but unprovable. Okay, but how can you prove something that's unprovable? You can't prove something that's unprovable. Conclusion is something wrong with our assumption. We made something screwy in our assumption. Again, we did this the last five slides. That's perfect. By modus ponens, this and this follows, gives you this. Okay? But this is not true. We cannot prove the real sentence. Conclusion is something wrong with our assumption. What's wrong with our assumption? Mathematics is consistent. It is not provable that mathematics is consistent. We cannot prove that mathematics is consistent. Something is wrong. Conclusion. Our assumption is wrong. Mathematics is not consistent. So this is called Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, and it says as follows: It is unprovable that mathematics is consistent. Mathematics second incompleteness theorem: Arithmetic cannot prove its own consistency. Okay. Now you can, you can don't don't get nervous and quit your job. And, and, <laughs> I also have you know every once in a while I just want to go. I have a cousin who works in trucking. And he says, I'll give you a job. <laughs> okay, but don't do it because it's not that mathematics is inconsistent. There's a higher level, namely, this is talking about arithmetic, but if you assume ZFC, which is set theory, set, it's been proven in the 30s, in the late 30s, by a guy named Genson that arithmetic is consistent. But, there was a problem. Okay, but it assumes that set theory is <laughs> now, how do you prove that set theory is Okay, so whatever. But it, it, it's, it's not so simple. Okay, summing up. So let's talk about Gödel's theorem. There are limits to the power of proof. There are basic statements in logic and mathematics that are true, but we cannot prove them. We cannot prove that basic arithmetic is consistent within basic arithmetic. <laughs> you can prove that it's consistent, but it's not within basic Okay, now. The book that I was passing around, 
I cover other topics like Zeno's paradoxes, ship of thesis. We talk about other hard problems, but also impossible problems. Not things that are take trillions of centuries to solve, but that cannot be solved by a computer. Okay. Now, there are many things that can't be solved by a computer. Is a painting beautiful or not?